in the evenings that you, you'd go up to the Bronx, smoke a bit of uh, Angel Dust, Zooty Bang, and have breaking battles, and uh, come back on the on the one train, and it was like you were in this snake, this this graffitied snake that was weaving wow. its way in the underground of New York. Yeah, and you could sort of see these dimly lit trains parked there, and and then the nearer I got, you could see this kind of dust coming wow. off off the, off the lights and, and, and all this kind of thing and I thought I could see like little bodies here and there and uh, and then the next thing this this dude just stands right in front of me and he's like yo what you right well, I've got the choppy throw up on it John had got the robo throw up and the next minute this tram driver's like running at us with this big lump of steel <laughs> and robo's like chalk mate do one <laughs> <laughs> they were dangerous areas uh, you know, I had a gun pulled on me on 125th Street, Public That's Enemy. You know, they yeah. were badass, man. Oh. They, were, they were talking about revolution uh, and civil rights. Parts and, and yeah, Mercedes, Mercedes. Yeah. 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 If you could get a Rolls Royce, you would have done yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, go find this guy. He'd be wearing a, uh, a smiley T-shirt. Get yourself one of them. <laughs> get one of them down your Gregory Peck and uh, <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and goodness. That promise that I'll yeah. take you to the promised land. Oh, Dude, I mean, yeah, when the when the angels from above yeah. uh, split, fall down. Oh, oh. There we go. And the angels, angels from, from above, above fall down and, and spread their wings. Yeah, like yeah, God. totally. It'll as take you some time out. And in hand, oh, Brothers, sisters, we'll make it to the promised land. land. Yeah. Actually be discussing it. We're going to change the world. This is actually a movement that's, once it's big enough, we can, we can make the world a better place. So are you ready to rock and roll? Always ready to rock. So, uh, right. <laughs> rock hard. <laughs> we, we, we rock hard. Rock stars always rock hard. We yeah. rock hard. Yeah, so yeah. let's kick it off with the intro. Lights, camera, action. On this week's show, we have someone who's lived through the punk and hip hop and acid house era, who's dabbled in the fine arts and left his mark around town with his hand style of fire, and was in the uh, notorious We Rock Hard WRH crew, AWE, IBM and RTW. We have the one and the only Chuck Stone in the bag. Yes, Chucky. Yeah. Chucky Pleasure Rock. Pleasure to be in your Woo. 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 Yeah. Let's take it back. Uh, it's great to have you in, man. And we're gonna, um, yeah, we're gonna take it back, back to the root, back to where it all kind of started for you. And we're gonna cover, you know, all that great history. Talk about the punk scene, the, the early hip hop scene in London. The acid house scene, mm. the tagging, the graffiti, the new trip to New York and loads of stuff. So it's going to be absolutely incredible. Mm. So anyone watching this, subscribe to the channel and share this interview around the socials. Subscribe and stay alive. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and I can't wait to cover the We Rock Hard history as well. Talk about King Robbo and, you know. Yeah, rest in peace. Rest in peace, King Robbo, yeah. We so, Rock Hard, rock star. Team Robbo, you know that. Mm. So um, first two questions I always start off with, Chuckstar, is basically, you know, where actually you from and what was it like growing up, you know, as a kid? Uh, I was born in Islington. Uh, well, Paddington actually was where I was actually born. My, hmm. The Cockney side of my family were from North London. Uh, my father was from the east end of uh, Glasgow. So I was uh, I stayed in London till I was about two or something, and then moved to the the West Country. Mum wanted me out of London. Didn't want me uh, growing up in the inner, in the inner city. Uh, yeah. and uh, went out to the West Country but she didn't like the kind of accent that I was I was getting and wanted to move nearer to her mum and dad who were still living in, in Islington so we uh, moved to Cambridge and I'm brought up, I was brought up in Cambridge And when, when did you move back to London? Uh, as soon as I could, sort of 15, 16 uh, so I ran away from home at 16 yeah, worried my mum terribly, but uh, yeah, yeah, I needed to get away at that time. Um, well, you needed needed to be released back in, into the London life. Yeah, well, I guess I just it just uh, it, it, I was brought up in a small white working class village, and it, it, you know, I was, 
they would take the mickey for wearing leather trousers or anything like that. So, so they wasn't it, really that open minded. It, it wasn't open minded, and they weren't. It was just wasn't. Uh, it wasn't big enough for me. I needed a big. You know, I, did, I was. It was a little paddling pool. I needed to swim in a big swimming pool in the ocean, mm. and find out what life has to offer. And uh, so sort of came up to London, was squatting, and all, you know that kind of thing, just to get my get a foothold with it, it back into London town. So when, when did you move back to London? What in the early eighties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have been in. It, uh, you know, I was coming up here quite a lot anyway uh, 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 for, for, the, for the punk scene, but um, mm. properly moved back. Yeah, it would have been eighties. Yeah, mid eighties. Yeah, and I, I can't wait to talk to you about that punk scene. I mean, obviously that was um, sort of late seventies, early early eighties. You know, tell me about the punk the punk era. So punk rock. Well, it was for me. It was that. That was the. I, I, I'd grown up on Motown and uh, mm. Philadelphia and and all that kind of deep soulful sound, um, and then I started experimenting with sort of Black Sabbath and Pink Floyd and that, that those those kind of progressive bands and rock bands, and uh, and then punk exploded on the scene, and it 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 just felt right. I, I just kind of. Uh, yeah, it was like a magnet for me. It was angry. It was political. Yeah. It yeah. was um, yeah. it was do it yourself, uh, and I just sort of yeah, like a magnet. It, it pulled me towards it, and it was great. Be you know, being an angry, disenfranchised youth, and it was it, a very very kind of outspoken, as you said, political and uh, social kind of uh, movement, wasn't it, punk scene? Yeah, it was pretty much kind of anti, anti everything, anti yeah. the establishment, anti the monarchy, yeah. um, do it yourself. You know, there was this whole kind of anarchist vibe. There was the anti-Nazi vibe, um, and and it kind of morphed as well. You know, you had, from punk, you had various branches of the, of the tree that kind of um, that grew from punk. So it was, yeah, it was an exciting time to be a very young man, for sure. And also, uh, graph-wise, I mean, there was a lot of political uh, graph back then, a lot of uh, lot band, the bomb graph. Yeah, a lot of anti-Nazi graph, a lot of um, yeah. uh, political graph, anti-government uh, graffiti, and, and, you know, like most scenes, there, there was drugs involved and, and there was a lot of speed being taken at, at that time. And in, 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 People would take speed and they'd call it speed writing. They'd be writing on the walls or, mm. or writing poetry or, or stuff like that. And also, you know, you had bands like Crass that got that were radically um, uh, underground and radically political. Uh, and that's when, yeah, that's when I kind of I went from scratching my name in walls and on desktops into making stencils and and I actually had sort of band names in my hair and all that kind of stuff just being angry basically yeah, yeah. and saying fuck you to the system and i want to be an individual i want to be different from the mainstream type thing i want to break away from 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 the sheeple for, for want of a word the kind of spark that lit that flame to get you you know get you into hip-hop well i ended up in new york at a very young age and was it was just got romanced by you know the minute i flew over manhattan it was like oh wow wow um i'm home uh not, I'm this is this is it was just like unzipping this world and going into a parallel universe you know this kind of naive tall lanky white boy all of a sudden just gets thrust into what was like a film set you know you must have been like a like a little kid in a sweet shop you must have been like your eyes like everywhere and like <laughs> You know, you must have been thinking, right, well, I need to go there, need to go there, need to do this, need to do that. How, when did you actually, when were you in New York? Uh, 84, 85. Wow, uh, so really, really early doors. Early doors, yeah, yeah. Hip hop was blossoming, dancing on the streets, um, people wow. living underground. Already, the graffiti scene was already very much alive. It, it was alive before the uh, journalists coined the term hip hop. You know, you got. Some of them older crews were listening to, to rock music and, and and stuff like that, you know. So, uh, you know, the RT, RTW crew were almost like hippies, you know, alternatives. Um, uh, so yeah, but so the actual hip hop itself, you know, you got the you got the disciplines, seeing people dancing on the street and smoking reefer in Washington Square Park and 
just everything the food the the 24 hours the nightclubs yeah the energy my hispanic homeboys my african-american homeboys it was just all so different and, it, and and very super exciting that must have been incredible and were the, were the trains they were still graft graft up trains were just insane completely bombed inside you know, there was no clean. there was no room left at all like and uh, uh literally i'd go i could i think it was 125th street i'd go up to um oh it may have been was it yeah i think it was 125th street and uh, and you could sit there and yeah. the trains would come out of the uh one tunnel on monday morning literally window downs top to bottoms freshly painted you could still sm smell the paint on them did so, you have did you have a little little dabble little uh, little bit, a bit of a uh, tagging when you was when you was out there yeah quite a lot yeah, yeah. uh so i, I I bumped into this uh, this kid. I was I was well. I was, I was living with um, Scotty Rock and Frosky and uh, Normski. And Normski's fame was obviously the rock steady Scotty, crew. Yeah. And he was uh, probably the first first kid to break dance in a movie. Flash dance is the movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, How on earth did you meet up with Normski and all the you know all them guys? Uh, well, I was I was staying with a friend at one Washington Square Park called Mandy, and I used to go and hang hang in Washington Square Park, and uh, I met this this kid Frosky, and just we just clicked, got on. He took me uptown to the projects, and that was it. Like I just m met loads of people, and where he was living. Uh, Amsterdam, uptown, mm. 80s and 90s, was literally where Rocksteady would hang out and so wow. make Frosty Freeze and various other people at that point, yeah. I mean that's that's proper early doors as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was early doors. People, you know, people were still still had big boom boxes and uh, and were dancing on the streets and, and then in, you know, the or they in the evenings that you'd go up to the Bronx, smoke a bit of uh, Angel Dust, Zooty Bang and have breaking battles and uh, come back on the on the one train and it was like you were in this snake, this this graffitied snake that was weaving wow. its way in the underground of New York. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, you know, that as I got a kind of a highlight through like that must have been a mind blowing. Yeah, it was mind blowing, yeah. Um, would you would you already kind of like a like a into your hip hop like already like a b boy a writer before you went out there? No, not really. I was just it, it was here, but it not at, you know not not in the depth it was out there. And, and um, but yeah, literally it took over my life. It just enveloped me completely. Um, Dude, was there was there any pieces back then on the trains that really kind of stood out? Did you see any sort of scene pieces or T Kid or? Uh, not really T Kid or Scene. I didn't. Well, yeah, I saw Scene. I took photos of Scene trains, these bubble letters and stuff. Um, uh, the the main crew for me at that point was probably TC5 um, and IBM because they were they pretty much owned owned uh, the One Tunnel and the One Tunnel has been owned by a lot of people. You know, the rock stars did a lot of cars in there. Um, Cos, Kel. Dondi, Shy, Mare. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. RTW owned it for a while. I remember the time Mare says, you want to come and paint a train to me? And he took me into the tunnel. It was like, oh my goodness, what's happening here? And also going to, there was another tunnel where this guy called Chris, his, his tag was Freedom. And there was this under, disused underground tunnel. And uh, Mare, Carlos took me down there. And... Uh, where where the where the light came through these kind of apertures in this concrete tunnel, mm. uh, Chris Freedom had sprayed all these chrome characters on leather jackets with 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 spray cans and Freedom, and it was just literally I'd escaped to New York. It was my goodness. Wow. And I'm walking along this tunnel, and there's what they called a track rats hut, where the guys that worked in the tunnels would uh, uh, hang out and, and have lunch or whatever, and I walked past this 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 hut, and there's a ta table outside, and and um, plates and knives and forks and stuff uh, just set up on it. And I'm like, "Yo, Carlos, what's this, man?" And he's like, "Yeah, people live in the hut, man. People live down here." Um, and I believe there was a I can't remember what the people were called that lived in the Freedom Tunnel, but there was a book 
um, published about these people that lived underground. But of course, it was for me. It was just mind blowing. You know. Yeah, there's a, there's a documentary that um, it's got a DJ. I think it's DJ Shadow soundtrack to it, and it's it's about people living like homeless people living in the actual underground. It's an amazing documentary. I can't think what it's called. I mean, anyone watching this, let, let me know. But I've got it on DVD. But it's brilliant. Yeah. It's about all the homeless people living in the New York subways. Mm literally living in 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 the old abandoned huts and yeah like i say setting up a table with uh, plates and knives it's wow yeah, underground and what, what what was it like walking you know walking like through the tunnel or, or near the rail the tunnel wasn't so bad the freedom tunnel because uh obviously there was no lot no electricity or anything but um I'd, I'd been given a couple of uh there was a time that carlos just took me down underground and we were running between stations because you, mm. you could you were able to run through stations so we run across these kind of wooden wooden board things right through the station but uh that that first time walking off the end of the platform and then going into the one tunnel was uh something i'll never for ever forget type thing it was just the two of us with a rucksack with our paint a bit of weed some cookies and milk We'd been, up, we'd been up to the South Bronx to get uh, some paint from Carlos's grandma's house. Uh, and then we just, he go, we get to this station and he goes, right, just keep walking. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, just walk into the tunnel. And I'm like, wow. And as, as we're approaching the, the layups, you got like three trains one side and I think it was three the other, top, other side. I'll stand to be corrected, but uh, and I could sort of see these dimly lit trains parked there and and then the nearer I got you could see this kind of dust coming wow. off off the, off the lights and, and, and all this kind of thing and I thought I could see like little bodies here and there and uh, and then the next thing this this dude just stands right in front of me and he's like yo what you write and I'm like what what do you mean what I write type thing and he's like what you write and I'm like uh, and then Carlos came up on my shoulder and he's like, oh, okay, you're down with Mayor. And I'm like, and I'm, he's like, yeah, come on in, bro. Can I do your 3D and stuff? And it was Case, you know. The, uh, wow. Yeah, I wasn't aware at the time type thing. Uh, mm. I think I probably would have got vamped if, uh, if I hadn't been with uh, Carlos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. What music was being played out there around 84? Was it kind of uh, still a bit of like, the electro stuff? And yeah, there was still... Um, the run DMC, all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, Run DMC, LL Cool J, um, the Fat Boys. I remember yeah. seeing them at the Roxy, and it was just Bigger. Pff, wow. I'd never heard of human beatboxing yeah. at, at that level, and it, obviously, again, it was like, wow, what is this type stuff? Yeah, because because they they took the beatboxing obviously to the to the next level. Yeah, they yeah. really did. They really did. Yeah. Um, but then you you also had you know like the All Stars need no music. Mm -hmm. The All Stars, stars need, need no music. music. Uh, the All Stars need. Pumpkin, that's and Pumpkin King, Pumpkin, King of the, the All Stars, yeah, King Pumpkin of the Beats, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the, so it was early electro. It was before it started getting a bit darker, and you had that kind of gangster rap coming in. It was that really nice, fresh electro and wonderful stuff. Uh, yeah, you had the Def Jam records as well. They were they were dropping dropping beats, original concepts, and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Beastie Boys. Yeah, the Beastie Boys. I was uh, I was hanging out with this with one of their well their ladies actually yeah for a good while yeah wow. so wait, when when you come back from london from that new new york trip you mm. must have been literally well up for like hammering you know hammering your name around town uh, yeah uh, you must have you must have got the you must have got the fever definitely had the fever and definitely was up for getting up still being a club kid so i sort of used to get up a lot around the West End, but then, you know, started meeting people at uh, Covent Garden. I remember meeting Czech and, uh, and, and, and Devil and Sham and Colt and all these kind of people, uh, Rev, they all came from, yeah. e from the know, clubbing. East London. So I'd go over to East London and I'd bomb East London with Czech and people like that. And then I'd go to, to, to Putney where Rev was living mm. and, and I'd bomb there and I'd go south to see Sham and Devil and bomb there and Colt and those people and then of course there was the uh, then there was the North London especially Islington which was re we rock our territory basically um, so yeah meeting Robbo uh, I met Robbo on New North Road outside my uncle's shop 
Drax live just Drax live just around the corner. And then of course there's uh, Doe's and PIC and my man Prime. Get well soon, my friend. You know what? What was the what was kind of like the reason behind you getting your you know getting your name up? Was it because you just wanted to be seen like all over London and? Yeah, I think it was ego. I think it was, it was very much thing, ego yeah. trip. Yeah. Um, and also I like to get up in very risque places and also places that mm. no one else had got up, like rooftops it, in the it, West it, End. It's a buzz, isn't it? It's a buzz, isn't it, Well, it is. It is. It's. It's. Uh, it, it massages the ego when you see your name yeah. um, um, up in lights, basically. You know, it's. 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 It's a way of advertising, you know, now it's a way of advertising a brand. We, we, we definitely didn't think about it in, in, in those terms back then, but uh, you want to get up, like, you know, like in New York, you wanted to get up, you, you, you did a whole car and it ran up and down New York all day long. Uh, so they were, you know, they were doing their own adver self advertising. And watching, in, watching, watching your name go by. Watching your name go yeah. by in lights and, and, yeah. and, well, it was, you know, it, it, it was free you, you know you didn't have the money to, to 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 pay for advertising or whatever you just went out and did it and did you would you say i mean did you love like the hand style i mean was the hand style a lot did you practice your hand style a lot um because because to be honest it's always wicked to see a really nice hand style wouldn't it um, yeah i definitely appreciate so, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was up there with the best with the hand styles at all. I was a, I was a bomber, a street bomber. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for me, it was, up, 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 it was quantity hmm. over quality. Um, and I, I had my style. I brought the heart with me. Yeah. Uh, it, it, as an I was going to say, how, how, how did that heart did that, fit with, with the tag? Because, uh, well, uh, um, obviously, um, PIC done that as well, didn't they? With their tag. Right, right. With the heart. Yes, yeah, he did. Uh, mine came from New York, basically. Uh, Carlos was very much... Um, they used hearts as O's, so that's where I, I appropriated that from. Of course, of course um, yeah. Carlos had a, a, had a thing back then called Crazy Love, and um, so, yeah, that I, I brought the heart. It was a New York love heart, and I brought it with me. Um, I used to change the style of my uh, tags, but um, it was about just getting, getting, getting up, getting it up there. That, uh, that was uh, the most important thing. Yeah, getting it, getting, it get, getting your name up. Yeah, for sure, and getting it in the in, in places where people are going to say, "Oh my goodness!" How did he get? get yeah, <laughs> did he get up there and do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah in, in the hottest places. You know? I mean, you got writers now. I think it's a guy called Ten Foot and other writers, and you're thinking, "How on earth? How on earth did they?" You know, put up ten foot up there on some bridge or whatever. You're like, wow. Yeah, That's yeah. Like. Shout out to ten foot. He's taken it. He's literally taken it to another level. I don't think there's anyone out there that's taken it to the to the levels he has for for street bombing. It's, it's, it's incredible. I, I drive down the motorway like in between, <laughs> and suddenly I see this huge ten foot like piece on the bridge or something. I'm like. How on earth does he do that? Yeah, he must get, like rope himself up and like yeah, hang, hang off it. Yeah, literally. literally. Yeah, yeah, like the bridge in Camden. There's a big robo and a big ten foot, and, and and there's no way you can get there unless you, you unless you're you, strapped up. You've got some kind of harness on and yeah, you're linked yeah. on somehow. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's literally a commando or something yeah. like you know. Like the S S A S of the grass world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like para paratrooper. Yeah. yeah, totally. It's yeah. amazing. And whose whose hand styles were you, you know? Was you rating back then? as well i mean there were some wicked hand styles i mean you had like the fume um id bomber you know all them guys from 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 wood, wood green area right. they was wicked i mean there were so many brilliant tags yeah i was still it it, it, it was interesting coming back from new york uh, uh you know everything was about wild style in new york and you kept mm. you come back to london and they were like, no, Wild Style's not where it's at, and all this kind of stuff. It's, it, you know, we've got our own style, our own letter styles, and which I kind of respected that they didn't um, copy New York. But then all of a sudden, bang, everyone's like, Wild Style is where it's at, type thing. Um, as for hand styles in London, Sham, you know, was a, 
I loved him. He was. He had he had a wicked essence. Well, didn't Sham fifty and the yeah. fifty nine. Do you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, he 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 got up. He got he got his name out there. And and then you got Devil six six six. Yeah, Dev. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Dev, uh, well, Dev was a wicked tagger as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, well, then you you know you had Robo everywhere and. Um, and you, you had um, Mode and all them guys yeah. from West London, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. who were, you know, there's there's can skills were probably second to none, even with New York at that point with Mode's characters. Oh, Mode too, yeah. I mean, yeah. His, his characters were on another level. They really were, and they, and, and Bando's Bando's lettering as well. You know, that mm. kind of, that 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 was uh, inspiring. But um, yeah, just you know, everyone. It, 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 you know, you had Merc, you had uh, Event, you had uh, all sorts of cats out there in London. Just and I, I, saying that, I can almost smell the ink in those pens we used to use on the buses. Oh yeah, what the pen tails and torch pens. The, I can't remember what the name of them was. It's, it was like a white barrel, and then it's it it sort of it opened up, and you took the plastic thing off, and you As a torch pen. Is that what they were? Yeah. yeah it was like yeah. a torch, wasn't it? With, right. a black, with a black top. And yeah. the ink that used to go in it, it had a. You can it smell it. You can smell it now. Yeah, yeah. You can smell it now. Yeah. And, and the buses used to get absolutely kind of battered. rinsed out. Battered. Yeah, 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 yeah. And do you, did you ever do the two tone where you put like like a red ink um, on the side of the pen, so you get like a two tone tag? Yeah, I had a uni wide from New York, and uh, mm. I was. Uh, I was taught to. Well, they show me if you mix the white, white, white ink with the with the blue ink, then you get the pastel blue, like wow. with the big, huge uni wide, which weren't there. There wasn't a lot of them in London at that time. There's very few uni wides being used. Uh, actually, this is one for you. In terms of like, you know, you got your taggers and all that, but in terms of like artists, graffiti artists, there were some amazing. And you touched on it just now, talking about mode two. Obviously, the trailblazers. London Giants, Giants, Zaki non, D, yeah, yeah, uh, non, yeah, non-stop art, yeah, uh, tough, tough art, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. non-stop, and, yeah, non-stop. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, all, all, all them crews were absolutely and scam, incredible. of course, scam, you know, that West yeah. London, yeah, 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 totally, yeah, but, Casby, Casby, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah, mean, yeah, what, yeah. what, what huge talents, yeah, yeah, really good, yeah. I so think Casby's that, still doing the hip hop thing and playing like seven inch b boy tunes and. Um, I think you know non-stop they're still out there doing their thing and um, obviously London Giants South London yeah they were amazing Jack Jack 302 yeah yeah and who was the cat that had the bridges in Camden smart he had a big smile piece with the uh, shade or, or shades shade. wow it was naughty yeah. and shade. very early as well like and Shades it, was early doors, yeah. Very early doors and very naughty as well with his with and his positioning it was yeah. brilliant. And yeah. once again, a place where it was difficult to do, like you know, on a bridge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very cool. Very cool indeed. Yeah. Right, Chokestar, tell me about uh We Rock Hard as well. I mean, who was actually in, in the full crew? Who was in the crew lineup? Uh so originally it was Robo, Doze, Prime. PIC and myself. Um, it was kind of born out of another crew. Uh, there's a big story about that with Peanut and uh, TDK. We used to write, which was part of a Tone Deaf crew. It was a uh, um, sound system from Cambridge, hmm. which in, in, you know included a few DJs and all this kind of thing. Um, yeah, they were the original members. Um, who who was it that started We Rock Hard? I believe Robbo and Doe's actually, because of what happened with the TDK, they got they were probably over in North London somewhere, Oxton, uh, smoking a big one and thought, right, you know, we'll we'll, we'll lose the TDK and we'll, I think I, I'm not quite sure who actually thought the name up. Probably Robbo, I'd say. We rock hard, yeah. Because it's a great name, isn't it? I mean, mm. WRH. I mean, you've got to give it to it. And then, by obviously, the Robo and the Doz and all. I mean, their positioning, like, I always remember the uh, the Robo, the R on the front of the trains. Yeah, he had literally. that wicked, wicked R. Yeah, his baby R. Yeah. Baby R. He was up, you know. And I'm not just saying that because he, he was my friend, he was my brother. He was up on the trains. Him and Doz smashed it, literally, every line at some point. You had those stainers because everyone were, at that point everyone was using um, hammerite, and because it was this enamel paint, 
you, 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 you do your throw up or whatever whatever you was doing and it would get buffed and there was the stainer do you know what I mean it was still there and the stainers were probably even better than the looked looked looks more grimy and underground and uh, yeah totally. what, what was robo like as well because i met robo it was would have been about 80 probably 86 87 mm. when we used to knock around outside the empire in leicester square right um yeah what was what was robo like we yeah well we were you know we were we were mates top boys uh loved his football loved his fishing uh loved his racking uh i think uh, Robbo and Chocky uh, racking sessions were quite legendary. Was know. they? Where, where, where was you going? Where was you going racking? Uh, All over. Right across London. I actually went with Peter from Nonstop to Amsterdam one time. Oh, uh, Pete! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we were bombing. Uh, we were bombing this. Uh, Play Play Two. Yeah, we were bombing this uh, um, tram, and uh, I'd got the Chocky throw up on it. John had got the Robbo throw up, and the next minute this tram driver's like running at us with this big lump of steel, and Robbo's <laughs> like, Chalk mate, do one! <laughs> running through yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, the story's the same as that in the yards as well with John, like, but um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we literally go racking in Europe wherever. Um, the good thing about Amsterdam is that they had this paint that you couldn't get anywhere. We, we didn't find it. it was this Krylon, but it was a black or brown can Krylon, and it had the most amazing colours as well. Uh, so we went there for the weekend with non-stop fade, and uh, we came back with bags and bags and bags of paint. Like, you know. Well, you brought, brought it back. Yeah, yeah, brought yeah. it back on the ferry. Um, and and here, you know, we used to make. We used to uh, we used to make special overcoats that we uh, we could take the lining out and put a big pocket in it and just walk in shops wherever North London South East and, and just drop the cans in in, in and, and, and they don't fall down into the lining of the yeah, coat. Yeah. And so you'd... so you walk in really skinny, then you walk out you look like you was massive. <laughs> and, and you'd have to walk out really slowly at times because they rattled, of course. Like, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. There was a uh, bearing in the can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a time in North London. I'm with uh, I'm with Dose and uh, Robbo, and literally the lining fell out the coat. So I had a coat full of cans, and then the next thing they're all falling out and rat rattling across the floor and it's just like oh <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant do you know what though i mean what what a great time i mean back then you know there was no not really much pressure was there you just felt you just felt free didn't you you, you wasn't like mortgaged up or families and all that sort of stuff you were just like let loose on the street weren't you yeah of course you were uh, and and you're right yeah there was a, nothing to tie you down no mortgages no kids mm. and you had the time and you were fearless as well back you then you, know, you could take risks yeah, yeah, um yeah. you know some of the some of the chases i've been in you know and that close to being caught a good good few times uh, but then you know we get we get we get back home or we'd sleep by the by the yard and get back home again smoke a big one and laugh our faces off about it but you know if but, you we'd know, have got as, caught it probably would have been a different story but you know as as kids you know you look back on it and you think what an amazing time do you know what i mean yeah yeah it was it was again it was rebellious hip-hop was similar to very similar to, uh, punk. to punk yeah uh which same as acid house it was uh you know do it yourself get out there self-advertise um dance on the streets or or, or or rapping or scratching or or djing or or, or painting trains and uh, uh, or whatever you know it was a, it was an industry mm. and we, we didn't see it as an industry then of course uh we were just because because chucky the thing is it, it was so new it was so fresh yeah. So, you know, we was kind of seeing it from from the ground, like obviously moving moving up. We see it growing into this kind of what it is today, like into an amazing culture. But back then, it was so underground. There wasn't really loads and loads of people into it. No, it was a, it was a very small scene at the beginning. Um, like I say, Covent Garden, all the writers would turn up every Saturday afternoon. Um, that's where I first met Czech from AWE. Uh, with with Carlos, I think that would have been around '86. Mm. That's when I started AWE. Uh, the, the reason I started AWE was because I was with hanging out with Carlos. It was that New York London connection. I thought, yeah, okay, all world, all world experts. Um, and the first all piece was 
done in East London, which was, I think it was a, uh, it was like a robot and all world experts in pump, bump legs, sort of, there was a purple and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, everybody knew each other and, and spats as well, you know, Saturday, yeah, spats. Sat, spats, yeah. Saturday afternoon. Oh, yeah. Tiny little club, but yeah. breakers going off and all the all the real proper b-boy music type stuff, you know. Didn't quite meet Roxy standards or Danceteria in New York, but still was yeah, very it, it exciting. Its, and it had its own kind of little vibe going. Yeah, of course it did. Yeah, it was in, brilliant. In terms of Covent Garden, I mean, what what a, um, a great place that was. I mean, obviously it was very underground. Around '82, it was a few people there. You know, it was a lot of buskers making money, and I think that's the reason why um, a lot of the b-boys used to go to Covent Garden was to earn a few quid to make a bit of money. Because obviously the tourists going to Covent Garden, you know, they was getting paid to show off their breaking skills. But kind of like 83, especially 84, 85, and then towards the beginning of 86, it blew up massively, didn't it? And there was like... <laughs> How would you describe Covent Garden to anyone that hadn't been there for the hip hop scene? It's literally like um, like a like a hip hop concert in one place, wasn't it? Like you had breakers there, you had the yeah, b boys, like you had the, poppers, yeah. beatboxers, boxers, you had the graffiti. I mean, like the graffiti there on the balls was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that was mainly Chrome Angels and all the guys, Chrome Angels, yeah. how, how they got how they got that uh, gig. I don't know, but uh, yeah, fair play. Uh, and then you had people like the Hulk, who was a break Hulk, dancer. Yeah. Uh, there was this other lad from Leeds as well, who was always spinning on his head. But yeah, so you had you had the graffiti writers there. They would turn up. In a, in, you know, you got you got your new gazelles on that you've just racked that week, and uh, or your your kangals or whatever your feelers. You know, the feelers and. Uh, and yeah, it was literally uh, sort of a beehive of of of. British hip hop uh, yeah. in it, it in its genesis type thing. You had a little bit of everything. You, people would be rapping. People would be, people would be uh, break dancing. People would w w yeah, literally. You know, you've got your black books. Everyone's sharing tags, and it was kind of a, a little mini U New York writers bench with a little bit yeah. of extra for yeah, yeah. for for uh, for the rest of the disciplines type thing. Yeah, yeah and I think very that, exciting. I, I think another reason that made Covent Garden so good was because it was so central and it was in central London. It brought people not just from London but also from outside London and also outside of the UK. I mean, the Rocksteady crew went down to Covent Garden. Um, Popping Pete from West Coast, he was in Covent Garden. I mean, you know, Futura was, was over in uh, yeah. West London. Yeah, I think he came with the Clash. And That's stuff. right. Yeah, was yeah. it eighty one, eighty two? That was super early. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. that that was the kind of that Futura piece was kind of the first kind of piece that was connected to like early, early rap, or, or then it became like obviously hip hop. Mm. So that was a really early. Like, seminal piece for London for sure big, yeah. big time yeah, that yeah, Futura yeah. piece was amazing like with the colours and the style yeah he's still at it too uh, old Lenny yeah he's, he's still pushing the boundaries and doing his art and uh, he's, he's an incredible keeping artist. it real well yeah. that, that whole car he did was was again seminal it was just colour wasn't it it was just <laughs> super inspiring and, and that circle on it and stuff and yeah a bit like the uh, the triptych, the the Dondi cars, you know, Children yeah. in the Grave. Oh. There's there's certain cars out there that that uh, you know you look at that Dondi whole car now and you think, my goodness, you know, it's timeless. It's, it's a timeless classic. And 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 and, and, the, and the outlines on, on on the letters and stuff, you know, and, and they have the basic materials as well. Then back then, you know, no low pressure cans and all this stuff it was just racked krylons and racked rust-oleums and and uh yeah some of them car and i think lee as well for me was hugely inspiring because it was very anti-war anti uh koch you know he did a lot of yeah, and that, yeah. that lion he did and you know wow and the wild style piece on on and the handball court you know there was there was what with the lion Lee was the lion, yeah, but yeah. then there was also the wild style piece on the, on the baseball court. Amazing. Super amazing, yeah. And Mind also uh, inspiring. on the album cover of uh, Jelly Bean. Yeah, What Upski. What Upski. Yeah, I mean, how good wow. was that on that rooftop? I think it was actually uh, Scene's partner. I forget his name. What? <laughs> what he, was, he was here like yeah. uh, six or seven years ago or something like that. Duster. Oh shit, Duster! Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I, I right. think Duster did that. I'll, I'll stand to be corrected again because, uh, you know, my history is not no, as good no, as no. other people's. But uh, well, listen, we're I'm, sure there, so. I'm sure he said he, he, he did that when he came over type thing. And that was a, an amazing rooftop. Yeah, it really was. Really, really was, yeah. But there was some, I mean, Subway Art in terms of a book. I mean, you know, that must have blown you away when you see Subway Art. I mean, yeah, well, so, I, so many key pieces in that one book. It, they call it the Bible. I call it the, the you know, what Henry did there uh, was, it, that was the face that launched a thousand ships, so to speak, you know. It was the most racked book in history. It was an urban myth and he he nailed it. You know, he's still, he's still cracking on with it with his, with his uh, he did some exhibition not so long ago with actual trains in, in, a mu in the museum and stuff and, and, and had some of the pieces uh, reflected onto the trains and he still, just because he decided to go out there and, and Martha as well of course, yeah, yeah. to go out there and document this stuff. And, it's, 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 inc it's incredible, it's like I, I interviewed uh, Scheme from the, uh, the Magnificent Team, right. no Scheme. Yeah. And I was asking him about that photograph with the scheme piece in the background and scheme like laying on one He's of lying the... On the He's uh, lying on the third rail, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he told me like he rang up Henry to come down to kind of meet him to take take the photograph. Yeah, yeah. Because none, none of it was set up. And, um, you know, because back then there was no mobile phone technology and there was none of that, was there? No, there wasn't, So it's no. literally you turn up with the camera or whatever and just, yeah. Well, I think, you know, the writers... The writers, so that's the They got to know him basically and, and and they trusted him uh and i'm not sure where he, he lived in manhattan somewhere and his his crib would literally be a hangout type thing uh where everyone would meet up great stories kel told me when the ball busters turned up one time to 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 just rob people and beat people up and um yeah so literally he became trusted enough they'd ring him and say yo we just done a whole car top to bottom that's coming out it'll be coming out of one tunnel Monday morning be there so he was literally getting first dibs on okay yeah yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, what, what an amazing guy and also obviously Martha as well what yeah, an amazing, exactly. amazing lady doing for what, what they've done going into some potentially extremely rough areas taking these amazing photo photographs of trains and graph mm -hmm. well they, they, they were dangerous areas uh, you know, I had a gun pulled on me on 125th Street. I was I was mugged in broad daylight in Brooklyn. Um, so yeah, and then you know, going into layups and into yards, you know, you people 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 got hurt badly in those places. And uh, so 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 yeah, they 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 it was a high risk uh, sort of hobby of theirs. They I'm, I'm sure they didn't realise that it was going to blow up into this enormous uh, industry that we have now same with uh, you know the film wild star um and then what's what's the film where they're breaking in star, the star wars where they're breaking in the roxy yeah 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 is that Be star wars beach Be street beach Be street yeah, yeah wow that 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 bit where the new york city breakers and, uh, and the rock steady get down to arthur baker's breakers yeah, yeah. revenge is Mind, mind blowing yeah really it really but, is but chugster you you think about it i mean mm. we talk about danger in terms of going into dangerous areas and all that but mm. it's also very dangerous going into yards i mean it ain't a place to be kind of messing with is it do you know what i mean no so, it certainly isn't not with uh not not with live rails and stuff like that you know you could uh i mean as a kid you know you might think well it's a bit of a laugh word but they're, da they're dangerous places do you know what i mean we used to do some you know in, in the london underground you, you once you know it, it was getting bombed we would jump over the over the over the line so we could get on the opposite side of the walls because they wouldn't get buffed as quick um i had this uh at the angel there was a i i don't know what i looked down the tunnel one time and i saw this this hut in the distance so i had this little place of my own where i could walk off the platform go and hide in this hut and every time a train pulled in, I'd jump out the hut and just smack a uh, throw <laughs> up on the back of the a train and yeah. stay in there for a good few hours. And then they'd come back round. So you got both ends of the train. 
So wow. yeah, we took risks and it, it didn't feel like we were taking risks. Uh, but now I don't think I'd jump over uh, jump over those lines. No, no I mean you'd be, be mad mad to do it now. Yeah, it's, mm. it's a, a different different ball game. Mm. And that, how did you um, how did you get your name Chocky as well? So Chocky goes back to the punk era. Um, um, started um, experimenting with uh, hashish and stuff like that and getting uh, what what was called the munchies mm. uh, uh, and getting yeah. it into chocolate but what actually happened was I was around a friend's house uh, Lisa she had this amazing big pink Mohican um, and uh, some chocolate bits a friend of mine took some chocolate biscuits out of the co coffee jar or the cookie jar and uh, but then blamed it on me uh, and so the girls, Cash and, and Lisa, called me Chocky, Chocky Boy. Ah, uh, so that's where they come from. Yeah. The chocolate. The chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, knew that. I thought it might have been from Chucky. You remember that, that character from the horror film? Right, right? yeah, Chucky the I book. I thought it was from that. Yeah, no, no, a lot of people thought that. I'd chocolate. never heard of that because that was spelt C H O C K Y. Yeah. And it, it wasn't until people said, did you get it from the story, from the book? I was like, no. So I went and had to find the book type thing. Like, Yeah, no, it was, it was because of my uh, uh, pon my love, penchant for uh, chocolate and getting blamed for uh, stealing these cookies out of the jar. It wasn't me. Like. <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> so like thanks, Mick. You know, yeah. I've, I've had that name for like 50 years now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that. What a brilliant story. Yeah. And right in terms of um, fashion as well, I mean, hip hop fashion was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, I've seen the photographs of you rocking like two pairs of gazelles on your head. Yeah, maybe, you know? maybe three. Yeah, I was. I was very good at uh, uh, racking. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah. What? Uh, so yeah. There was. Well, of course, there was the fat laces. There was the kangles. There was the the um, my belts. Name belts, yeah. yeah. Wow, Chalky Rock one, yeah. I wish I still had that, yeah. Um, there was what, track suits as well, were still kind of fashionable. Um, high tech trainers with the fat laces, you had the, the feelers, so they were like black and they had a little red and white stripe down the bottom there. What, the which, boots? No, these were the shoes to oh, begin shoes. with, yeah, yeah. I could almost have a museum if I kept all the stuff that I've uh, lost over the years. And you, did you uh, get the goose as well? Goose no, I never went for a goose type thing. No, I probably couldn't afford it back then. Uh, and, they, and they weren't easily rackable, those things. They were kept, they, they, they were specialists and they, they were They was wired, they was wired up. Yeah, they were specialists yeah. and they were kept away. Well, they, thing, they was big know. money. Did you ever go like Four Star General as well, mm. a bit later on, around kind of 86, 87? To where? Four Star General. You know the uh, hip hop shop in Carnaby Street? No, I didn't. Don't think so. No, I'm 86. I was still in New York, like most of the time. Uh, and then Kate brought Carlos over, and we went on a little tour and went up to uh, Norwich. And a friend of ours' father was head of the art school, so we did our first um, kind of presentation oh. uh, on, on graffiti in New York and stuff. But um, I used to blend all types of fashion, just boxing boots and, and you used to have the um, kind of uh, tacchini uh, jackets that you could spin on the floor with and sort of blend that sort of sort of almost punk hip hop style type thing. Like. And Chogster, would you go into uh, the London clubs around 85 or 86, <clears throat> you know, clubs like the WAG? Uh, Westworld, Raw, Delirium. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, so you had Darrell at the, at the Wag. Um, Mud, Mud Club. Mud Club was a big one for that us. That was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, Mud Club was very big. Um, because that was Mark Moore and Jay Strongman. Jay Strongman uh, yeah. And you'd get. I remember one night in there with Rev and we dropped some LSD and. Uh, and they were playing all uh, play, all the b-boys were in there and it was all psychedelic and stuff and uh, and then mark moore dropped this um acid track and 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 rev and i like kind of looked at each other and it was like wow wow what's that because it, it was cutting up an ll cool j song and we couldn't work we thought that's not even scratching how are they doing that and we just ran up to the booth peered over the groove uh, over the over the DJ booth and there was this like uh tracks record from Chicago called it uh Cool J Tracks or something and that that was that was the very first time we got started hearing this new music that was coming in from uh from 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 Chicago type thing so it would be just ice cold getting dumb and then the next minute it would be uh um Cool J on on tracks records and it was 
Oh, what's this? Yeah, <laughs> We've yeah. got the new hip hop coming through yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you another big tune as well, and everyone will know this was Nitro Deluxe. Let's get brutal. Let's get brutal. Yeah. I mean, how, how mad. I mean, because we was like right bang into our hip hop. Mm. But when we heard Nitro Deluxe, mm. we was like, this tune is like amazing. It was like kind of like, reminded me of like a little bit like the electro stuff in the early 80s. Yeah. Did, 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 punk, hip-hop, acid, the music that came out of those scenes was was, was and still is inspiring, um, unforgettable. Um, uh, you know, some of the tunes, the early Acid House tunes, the early Electro tunes, um, Public Enemy, you know, they yeah. were badass, man. Oh. They, were, they were talking about revolution uh, and civil rights and early doors yeah yeah they were the, they were almost the, the you know the, the the punk rockers of uh, of, of hip hop you know mm. saying big finger up to the system almost kind of anarchic um, and, and taking the mickey with their with their, with these big clocks and stuff which takes me back to london when everyone was racking um, volkswagen uh, nicking the that's the, right because the Beast Beastie Boys, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know who did it first, but yeah. like, yeah, everyone started wearing like, car parts and yeah. Mercedes. Mercedes. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you could get a Rolls Royce, she would have donned yeah, that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, that was so. That, that was funny. And the flail flight jackets, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, the boy Soho boy badges on and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Sort of the black bomber jackets and. That's where the, the, the London scene was sort of going rare groove as well, type thing, you know, yeah. just before the Acid House. Because uh... back, back then in the clubs, it was really rare groove and hip hop, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. Tunes like mm. I'm the Godfather, do -do 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 -do, and things, tunes like that, and mixed in with like, you know, James Brown and all that. I mean, going back to. Um... Jimmy Castor Bunch, we're going to oh, go back, yeah, way done. back. Back yeah, into time, yeah, 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 badass, proper, absolute tune. But, um, yeah, I mean, rev. I mean, you spoke... yeah. I mean, uh, talking about the Mud Club. I mean, that's that's where I first met met Rev. Right. So yeah. that would have been about yeah, about eighty eighty seven, eighty six, eighty seven. Rest, rest in peace, Rev, man. Rest in peace to Rev. Yeah, yeah. and Rev, man with his long dark hair, I mean he was such, you know, he, I remember him like breaking in the mud club. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, he was such, such a, such a, long such hair, a club, nice he was guy. a club kid. He was uh, such yeah. a laugh, wasn't he? Bro? Yeah, he was a b-boy club kid, yeah. out of Putney, lived in the block of flats with his mum, um, and he, yeah, he, he, he got on board at one point, he, his, his image was all over uh, Times Square, New York for, I can't remember what brand it was, but, yeah, because he done a bit of he did a bit of modelling. Yeah, he did yeah. did a bit of modelling at, at, at one point. Was was uh, uh, literally all over the place. And uh, but yeah, he was he was very eccentric in his own way as well. He he'd wear very different clothing. Uh, he danced differently. Um, and he also kind of progressed from hip hop into sort of deep house music, very mm. deep house music, and very uh, that that very original new york garage sound type stuff yeah. because because rev was like he was probably one that, apart from form from london giants i mean form had long really long hair mm. like i mean i'm on about like 80, 84 85 form yeah. had like long 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 hair mm. but rev was one of the um, the few people i see and he grew his hair really long like early doors he did yeah. did you remember like remember that long haired look yeah. in, the ha in the house scene like everyone used to have like long hair or the uh the acid house the scene yeah 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 the, car the carpet hairstyle yeah, yeah like a bob type <laughs> thing on geezers but uh yeah rev had long hair before the acid house people yeah took it on and yeah. they all had long curly hair and all this kind of thing like yeah but uh yeah yeah, big R.I.P. to Rev. Yeah, big R.I.P. to Reverend. Chogster, like, the early house scene was incredible. I mean, it really kind of brought people together. You know, unity 
from all races and all nations dancing under one roof, a bit like, you know, one nation People under a group. People one nation dancing together. And yeah. you know, that, that, that's what the house scene did, didn't it? It really brought, I mean, you know, you had your football thugs and all that, like dancing with like, you know, your hippies and your b-boys or whatever. Mm. And it really kind of, you started to unite people together, like the early house scene. Right. Especially, yeah. especially as you know, around like eighty-seven, especially eighty-eight and eighty-nine. Mm. It was absolutely incredible, wasn't it? Uh, well, yeah. It was uh, again my first experience with that was um, I, got, I was I was doing uh, some artworks and graffiti for uh, Gorilla Records, um, and I was pre presenting them some some graffiti. Uh, some graffiti art. I think it was for Baby Ford actually. Mm. It was a baby piece, and um, as I'm as I'm presenting my work, to, he goes, "Have you ever been to Shum?" And I was like, "No, mate, I haven't." Um, and he goes, "Well," and I said to him, "Well, I'm going to Amsterdam for the weekend." And he's like, "There's a Shum party in Amsterdam this weekend. You should find it." Um, so I, I I I drove to Amsterdam and. Uh, Met, just bumped into these two, an English guy and an Aussie guy, Kevin and Freddie, and they were handing out flyers for Shum. And I was like, okay. And they go, you never been? I was like, no. Nope. And they went, okay, come with us. So I helped them with the uh, handing out of flyers around Amsterdam. Amsterdam's a great city, of course. Back then it was um, very kind of liberal, open minded. Um, a lot of people went there for the weekend to have fun, uh, relax, let their hair down. Um, and so we ended up, it was at this huge warehouse just on the outskirts of Amsterdam with these big, big doors with these numbers written on them and then it had this kind of sculpture with this flamethrower throwing all these flames into the air and, uh, and, and Kevin's like, have, you know, have you ever had an E? And I was like, nope, no, I never had one. And uh, he goes, well, go and find this guy. He'll be wearing a, a, a smiley t-shirt Get yourself one of them. <laughs> Get one of them down your Gregory Peck, and uh, <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was uh, it was it was out the back of a lorry, and it was uh, it was rampling, and uh, Norman J was there, and uh, they were these little yellow ones, and um, obviously I, I I didn't take it easy. A lot of people start with a half. I just got the whole one down there and uh, <laughs> I think within an hour I was in love with everybody in this yeah. warehouse and walking around eyes like Lucy in the sky and meeting him I met Danny and I met uh, Jenny at that point and you was hugging was you going around hugging everyone and hugging like, everybody like, yeah. and the music just oh yeah. my goodness some of the tunes that were dropping the night writers let the music use you oh. and take some time out by Arnold Jarvis were just Blowing me away! It's promised like, oh, land. Oh my goodness! And that promised land. I'll take yeah. you to the promised land. Oh, Good. I mean, yeah, when the when the angels from above yeah. uh, spread, fall down. Oh, oh. There we go. When the angels, angels from, from above, above fall down and, and spread their, their wings. wings like yeah, yeah, God. totally. They take some time out. And in hand, oh. Brothers, sisters, we'll make it to the promised land. land. Yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. I mean, you can picture it now, isn't it? I mean, it was absolutely incredible, wasn't it? It was it, like, it, wow. Yeah, it really was. And as you say, that, that music mixed in with other little bits and pieces, you know, on top. It was like, it was like a spiritual experience. It was like, you'd like be rushing off your head, like, and just like, <laughs> yeah. going crazy, isn't it, Chucky? Like, you were in love. Um, you, you were in love with the music. You were in love with the feelings he was in love with everybody around you um you know we we were throwing our own parties and uh, and tonka and they were they were legendary because you could you could be gay black white yellow pink didn't matter really didn't matter mm. at all everyone was welcome the, the 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 only rules we had if you come into our party party hard and enjoy yourself type thing first sort of 10 acid house parties were just they were spiritual and you and, and we you know you'd go back to the after parties and you'd actually be discussing it we're going to change the world this is actually a movement that's once it's big enough we can we can make the world a better place you know, like you know the song someday and all this kind of, the, the lyric how the lyrics for the songs and the mixture of the crowd and the effects of ecstasy were perfect 
it really was a moment in time that those when you were up I mean I'm rushing I'm rushing like sitting in there like getting goosebumps thinking about it now it was like and as you said there was key tracks I mean the water boys as well um hole of the moon mm, not sure of that one yeah I picture the rainbow you held it in your hands oh there was just so many Ooh, oh yeah so many Max Thornhill who's going to eat the who's going to ease the pressure there's so many so many really good songs coming out of Chicago coming out of Italy coming out of Belgium the new beat and all that stuff yeah wow how, yeah. and how did how did Tonka form I mean who formed Tonka sound system uh well there was there was that that goes back to sort of Cambridge we there was there was a bunch of us, us guys and girls, uh, some you know feminists, um, uh, hippies, punks, um, misfits. Uh, you know, just not kind of your general kind of person. And there was a pub in Cambridge. Uh, it was called the Midland Tavern. It, it, it was at the back end of Mill Road, and he had this back room where he would play disco and reggae and yeah so this is where we got turned on to reggae and he had a pool table in the other room so that's where people congregated and that's where we met and that's uh, where I met Harvey for the first time um, he pulled up on his motorbike high as a kite fell off it laughed <laughs> uh, and, and I sort of looked at him and because he laughed I was like right oh, okay I like this guy and yeah. uh, we got chatting uh, and from there on in yeah, we were inseparable I mean Har Harvey Har anyone watching this uh, Tricky's on about DJ Harvey who's absolutely huge now but um, mm. so Harvey cut his you know his teeth early doors as well he did yeah he's he uh, so he, he had his girlfriend Helen at the time had a flat in Tooting, and he he had he, he aspired to be a DJ type thing. And um, he's an amazing DJ. Um, yeah, he is. Yeah, he got some decks, and and we would go down there again, smoking smoking reefer, cutting up breaks because you had those ultimate breaks and beats as yeah. well. Like you know, because yeah, yeah. getting hold of the originals was was yeah, expensive. It's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so we would just be cutting up brakes, spinning, spinning the brakes backwards and forwards, and um, and then he went to live with Rev, uh, and and then he he was like, you know, we're going to throw our own party, and and then Tonka Rob came along, and Phil and Rob got a uh, his his grandmother passed away, and he got a big inheritance, and he just went out and bought a, t uh, a turbo sound system. Wow! Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, most people would buy a car yeah. or a house or something. Well, Rob's just like, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to buy a big sound system. What a brilliant, brilliant and, thing to and do. painted them yellow and, and wow. used the Tonka logo on them. Amazing. Um, and we we threw some parties in London, um, and then Harvey got the club in Brighton, the Zap Club. I remember the first night we took all our mates from Cambridge and, and a few people were at university in Brighton and it, it, it wasn't packed the first one but uh, all the ingredients were there. We put the deck we put the decks, I think that was Harvey's idea to put the decks on the um, in the dance in the middle of the dance floor, whereas normally DJs were a bit exclusive and away from everybody. He's like, right, we're gonna party with the people, decks in the middle of the floor and um, that was quite unique at the time and um, that first night it went off it wasn't packed but it went off but then word spread very very quickly who was who was on the decks like you was on the decks uh, Harvey so you'd have Rev. Rev to begin with then I'd warm up well we'd both warm up and then Harvey would finish the night off and then we take uh, we take the sound system to the beach up the road Black Rock uh, with a generator uh, and then you'd have Marky Mark and, and, and Thomas and whoever else, uh, Felix, all those guys would be playing uh, records till early hours of the morning type thing. People dancing on the beach in love. And how was you, how was you promoting, you know, promoting uh, Tonka? I mean, because this is like, this is way before like mobile phone technology and internet and all that. So was you doing it the old school way with like flyers? Yeah, we did, we did, we did a few, we did these little little flyers i think it was only three quid or five quid to get in but um um i think word of mouth is really what did it we did we weren't it wasn't um that contrived we didn't sit down and think right we're going to promote it this way we're going to promote it that way we did get a little bit that we had a newsletter 
but this was a, a bit further down the line and we had and then we did the membership thing um, but originally it was just a load of us saying right let's have a party for some mates and then it had a party for mates you didn't, you didn't stop partying we didn't stop partying yeah. and we've only just stopped part well you know we still have a little party every now and again but uh, not every weekend type stuff. Did Har Harvey ever go uh, doing a bit of tagging as well? Yeah, Harvey B, yeah. But I was the real animal when it came to uh, bombing. Yeah. Uh, he you, was, you, he you, really, you really had the fever. Yeah, yeah, I definitely got it, got it, uh, got it bad. Uh, yeah, the fever was bad and, uh, or good, or bad meaning good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not bad meaning bad, but bad meaning good. Yeah, really. Tom was Dead Bass. Tom Dead Bass. Oh, ah, that was another tune, wasn't it? Yeah. Original concept. Yeah, badass oh, on Def Jam. Such a tune. Mm. Well, yeah. I think, you know, some of those producers, you know, like Frankie Bones, mm. they, they they came out of graffiti and they came out of hip hop. Yeah. But and then they yeah. started cutting up cutting up uh, old hip hop beats and turning them into house music tunes Fra and Fran stuff. Frankie Bones as well. Yeah, I said that's Frankie Bones, yeah. You had and the Bones, you had the Bones Bones breaks, breaks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, wicked, oh, yeah, really good. good. Yeah. Them at home. Yeah, yeah, I've still got them, yeah. They're amazing. Yeah, very and, cool. And, uh, where, you know, where was you buying your crop from back in the day? You know, where was you, uh, where was you buying your tunes from? Was you going like a Groove record? So and... Groove would be for the hip hop, yeah. definitely. Uh, that, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, it was Tim from XL that owned Groove, and I think that was his mum that was in the shop that was always taking the money type stuff. But then for ha for ha for Acid House, it would it would have been uh, Black Market for house music, and for the more Balearic vibe, there was Trax Records, mm. and then there was all sorts of record shops all over all over. London, but there were so were, so many great record shops, wasn't it? Yeah, and there was the there was Unity, and but there was also the second hand shops, which were always fun to spend Saturday afternoon rifling yeah. through, looking at labels, looking who's produced it. And Craig at tracks for for all these kind of Balearic Italian disco tunes and stuff like that. Yeah, there was some uh, absolutely amazing record shops. There was the a lot. Yeah, there was a lot of record shops. Um, well, I ended up with one, so... I was uh, going to say, so yeah, you ended up you know, with, with Chucky's, Chucky's tunes. Yeah. I it's, remember coming in, I'm sure it was around by um, Leicester Square somewhere. Well, I started off in Carnaby Street. Um, yeah. I was working with uh, Roy de Roach and there was a... There, it, it was Quaff at that point. Um, they, dis they decided to leave and I decided to stay. Uh, yeah, the rent was outrageous back then um, for, that little, for that little spot late 89 type it, stuff yeah really yeah I called, I called it tom Coyd records to begin with mm. um <clears throat> it was like 400 quid a week for this uh tiny little corner um is that the shop because I, I remember going down a staircase and you could hear this pounding <laughs> this pounding sort of techno -y trance music yeah. and you go in there and chucky honestly you was like you was <laughs> having it in this little record shop like literally it was going off yeah. it was like a club it was like a club yeah it really was um, like a club now that was the third sort of reincarnation of the shop <clears throat> so I started in Carnaby Street I was paying a lot of money and they wanted more <clears throat> so I thought you know what I'm going to go and have a look around Soho and see if I can get anything cheaper and I got, mm. I got somewhere half price um, below Boy uh, in old Compton Street um, so I was down there I don't know how long a year or two um, had this had this big speaker very loud and and uh, it was just getting too busy I couldn't get enough people in there um, so again I thought oh, I need to get bigger and I remembered this old shop down St Anne's Court it was a shop full of kind of rockers and rock music and stuff and I thought let me go and have a look at that one down there and it had gone <clears throat> and there was a to rent sign on on the on the on the it was almost like it was meant to happen mm. and uh so I, I phoned up the owner and i went to these really posh offices in uh in, in piccadilly um and, and struck a deal with him and i was i was saying to him i just don't know what to call it time thing type stuff and he goes well what's your name and i said well it's chucky and he went more there you go there's your name chucky's tunes so i called chucky's it chucky's tunes and i but I, I called it c h e w n s and that was tune so you're chewing so when you was when you'd had a uh, an a jack and a jack a and jill down the gregory peck you were chewing <laughs> so 
So that's why it was called tunes, because it was relating to the chewing that you were doing when you were... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, I never knew it was from that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. There's always a reason for everything type stuff. That's where I stayed in the end. It was a, it's a very big basement. I um, Half of it I turned into the record shop, and then in the other half I started investing in electronic music equipment, like 303s and 909s. And it literally grew from a... 303 and a 909 on a cardboard box into a multi-track 32 track studio with uh, Moogs and, and, uh, and all these I started collecting synthesizers and effects machines and and was just <coughs> Producing music and producing lots of other people type thing. I never knew that so you was actually you got involved with the production as well Yeah, I was releasing <laughs> Uh, well, it started in in Carnaby Street. I, uh, there was this there was this guy that was working with Carl Cox, Simon. He came in and said, you know, do you want to make some tunes? So this German guy came into the shop one time. Says, have you got any techno music? And I went, do you mind just coming round to the studio, mate? And uh, can you say that again into the mic? And uh, he's like, yeah, no problem. All is clear. And we we went to the studio. Um, with Lovejoy and uh, uh, got him to say it. Have you got any techno music? And then we made a record out of it type stuff. You sampled um, his voice. Yeah, sampled wow. his voice. And then these, this, I can't, these, there was these people came to us um, and said, you know, we've got this studio. Would you like to produce some music in it? Um, I was like, yeah, why not? Um, we played at the Ministry of Sound for the uh, to re for the release of the album. Um, and I did that work there, but then I got to know the the, the studio was on um, <coughs> Holloway Road. No, no, uh, Upper Street. Is Upper that top of, top of Highbury Corner? Near there? No, yes, near, yeah, it was, just a bit further along. That's right. Cause Monroe mate, Studios, it was what called. What was it called? Monroe Studios. Monroe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My mates, my mates put, brought out a track, and uh, when, when they was uh, in that studio, Monroe's, yeah. They was called URS, Urban Rhyme Squad, like rappers. Right. But Soul to Soul, Jazzy B were actually recording in there at the same time. Yeah, right. it's more on roads, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I met the um, I met the engineer and uh, and I was thinking of break beats and I'm lying there one night and I'm saying to myself, right, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna make a tune. And I went back to the studio. I took some breaks with me um, and wrote a tune called uh, Hoovers and Spray Cans. Um, just thought, yeah, okay, it's not bad, it's all right, it's all good. Designed the label, all sort of graffiti-ish, and, and put a couple out, and it just it took off. It went mad type thing. And I'm driving, a, I'm driving along Friday night, and it's on the radio, and, I, and I'm going to, to 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 telepathy on the Saturday night, and it's getting dropped. But Jumping Jack Frost is wow. rinsing it, and it's just like. Wow. I, 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 how did it make you feel like when you heard that in a club or other DJs playing it? That must have blown your mind. Hearing it on the radio was super exciting. It was like, wow, it's just like, is oh, it yeah, this is yeah. like Chuck has gone from from the streets to getting his name on flight. So the whole, you know, the whole, everything was linked to the graffiti to getting the name out there. The labels were handmade. Well, it was um, called Hoover and Graffiti? It was called Hoovers and Spray Can. Oh, so I actually sampled can. a spray can. No. And tss, tss, no, really? Yeah, wow. with all these, I'll, 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 I'll send you a copy of it. Uh, so you can, it, it took off massively. Um, I was getting phone calls from majors and all that kind of stuff and, uh, I was also releasing bootlegs at the time as well, so I was. Uh, have you, Chucky? Have you got a digital uh, file of that you can send us? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got it all on DAT, and I'm speaking. I'm going to speak to someone next week about possibly relaunching and uh, mm. uh, um, uh, releasing the back catalogue and all that kind of thing. But uh, it was very, it was, it was. There was a punk vibe to it. There was a very much a hip hop vibe to it. If you, you hear the breaks in it, you're going to be like, oh can, can yeah. You, can you remember some of the breaks? That you were uh, the, the famous break, dum duck, dum duck, dum dum duck, which is the incredible bongo Apache. back. Right, Apache. right. And I, 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 uh, I rinsed two breaks together at the same time. Um, and the bass line was um, like a dub reggae bass line. The strings were the Sex Pistols. Um, like I said, I, I sampled a, a spray can and a Hoover, 
and I, and I had Jocelyn Brown on, on vocals singing, uh, I, I, which was a sample, of course. I just can't get enough. But it really did take off, and I, I couldn't get enough records out there at the time. And pretty much set, set me on the road. Uh, I made enough money out of that to buy more equipment and, and then start producing more music within my own studio and not, not paying someone else to do it for me. Yeah, wow. In the right place, right time, and literally thousands of records getting distributed around the world with my name on it again so it was a game that you know it was i'm getting up but now i'm going worldwide yeah, it's yeah. that world expert thing i'm, get, I'm getting out there and, and getting my name on flyers it was that progression and if uh Chugster, you got some like big highlights from back in the day i mean is there anything that really kind of stood out in graffiti wise, music wise, um, yeah, graffiti wise and, and music wise. Uh, graffiti wise, I think being taken to the tunnel, meeting K's, uh, hanging out with Dondi and Kel and uh, 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 and, and Mayor, um, going to the, yeah, definitely going to the tunnel, going to the Freedom Tunnel. Uh, Getting busted by 5 0 two or three times, you know, by the by the American cop. Meeting Grandmaster Flash at the Roxy was uh, was 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 wow, you know. Um, how, how, how did you meet Flash? Did you get introduced? Yeah, so it was like Mandy had juice at the, at the Roxy, and she got us into the VIP lounge. But then there was a VI VIP lounge within the VIP yeah, lounge yeah, yeah. And, uh, where the top 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 VIPs are yeah and uh, I, I, so I blagged my way in literally because I had a, an English accent and uh, walked into this room and there, there was Flash and, and, and the five were there and they, they, had, they had hands full of dollar bills and uh, yo yo English homie give me five and all this and I didn't even know what five was at that point type thing and uh, so that was special seeing the breaking Going up to the Bronx, uh, watching the breaking battles. Um, Which can you remember what parts of the Bronx you was going to? Uh, so one thirty ninth Street. Um, so you could literally walk up, up, well, get the trains up to these areas and come out, and there'd be a shop front, and you'd walk in the shop, and it'd be just bulletproof glass everywhere, type thing, and, and there'd be like uh groceries and stuff but it was actually a front for for drugs basically you could go in buy a dime bag a tray bag a nickel bag um or you could go to the to the to the tenements um the projects and there would be a front door with a hole in it and that was it you just knock knock on the door they would uh okay. say what do you want yeah. you either put your ten dollar bill your twenty dollar bill or your five dollar bill in and then a bag of bag of sort of normal Colombian weed would come out time stuff so yeah it was all it was all that so with the, the whole of New York was just just so inspiring and and, mm. and still lives with me to this day you know that's how much effect it's you know I'm still wearing shell toes for instance with fat yeah, laces to, uh, to team Robbo as well yeah to the original team Robbo which was re rock hard basically. That was the uh, that was that was that's who Team Robbo were. I went His I went team. to I went to Robbo's uh, funeral. Uh, Fullard, the, the comp that you know in, in my cab, and um, went to the pub up by Highbury Highbury Barn. Yeah, it was pretty sad, wasn't it? That that funeral. It was very sad, but to see you know the whole of the community come out. I mean, it was all, all outside Arsenal Football Club. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there's literally there was like. Thousands of people like gathered for Robbo's funeral. It was um, it was an amazing send off. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Uh, we 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 uh, we had the idea of um, uh, sort of getting art and selling it. And uh, what do you call that? We had a kind of we had a club night uh, and uh, I went went to one in uh, in Shoreditch. Yeah, Red, Red Gallery or somewhere. It was somewhere like that. So there was that one which was, yeah, which wasn't really so much an auction. That was an actual gallery show. And we got all the, I, I got a load of art in from New York, from people, and that sold really well. It sold much better than the street art, actually. Um, but the original, the original night was at uh, a club in Shoreditch under the bridge where Irons done one of those big uh, black and white letter things. Do you know that, what's that club under the bridge there? Cargo. Yeah, Cargo, Cargo. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did an auction there and a club night. Uh, and we got a load of artwork and we, we made a lot of money and that's yeah that's how we uh, 
that's how we sent Brother John on his uh, on his next journey type thing. But uh, a big, uh, big, big, big RIP to uh, to Robbo and, and Rev and. To be honest, and everybody else we've lost along the way as yeah, well. Yeah, there's a lot of cats, a lot of a lot of dudes gone. Uh, you know, there's the New York guys, Dondi, Shy. Yeah, there's the London, Rev, Robbo, um, and, and lots of other cats as well. But uh, luckily, we're still blessed to be here and, and still doing our thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, literally New York was just mind-blowing all the way. Um, <laughs> House music, uh, I think those first initial acid house parties at Shum were, were beyond inspiring. They mm. were, um, and, and, then, and then just, you know, opening up the first record shop and, uh, and being extremely worried about it and anxious about, you know, I've put everything into this, that's all my money gone again uh, that I'd saved up. And, um, and thinking, uh, it, it, I'd nearly given up actually. I, I, I was, I, I've been working, and I was breaking down. And and Heidi's girl, Hi, Harvey's girlfriend, Heidi, just grabbed me and said, "Look, just keep going. Whatever you do, don't give up." And uh, those words helped me along. And uh, yeah, I basically got my own shop, which was for me a paradise. New records all the time, meeting new people, selling them. You know. It was, uh, and then building the studio up and then being able to produce my own music. Um, uh, yeah, and, and then it, 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 well, it got super commercialized at the end of the day and it was very easy to make, to make money from it type thing, you know. Enough money to buy, a, buy property and all that kind of stuff. It literally transformed from this kind of ideological world of misfits where we just were doing it for fun and within a few years just I couldn't believe how much money I was getting paid to to, to do what I loved and, uh, and what I did for fun. What, what, what kind of killed it off? Was it kind of like the digital? Digital, digital world definitely CDs? killed it off uh, and yeah it was just the sort of you know, I headlined at uh, Pendragon on New Year's Eve for a couple of years and, and it was packed and then the next time there wasn't so many people so there was this kind of lull in the raving scene as well. Also, um, you know, I, and, and I wasn't getting as many bookings as, as I was. I was flying all over the world at one point and so literally record sales were dropping, um, Gigs were, were, they were becoming less and that record shop started uh, closing. It was like, oh, mm. you know, this is a... It must, have, must have been a bit soul destroying. Yeah, it was from a, going from something you loved to suddenly it being basically being squashed. Yeah, and it was it was a pivotal moment. It was mm. like, do I, you know, this, it felt like the ship was sinking. Mm. Um, um, and what do I do, you know? Uh, I, so I literally had to go back to school and learn carpentry and all that kind of thing. And then but, you re yeah you retrained, didn't you? Yeah, I retrained um, as a carpenter. Got my carpenter's ticket uh, and just made myself just yeah moved on up again through the ranks from from literally working as a labourer while I was at school, earning nothing in a joinery workshop and. Uh, and then once I've got my ticket, going out onto the sites and earning earning money, and then managing people, and now I'm, I'm here where I am. Mm. Doing doing very well for yourself as well, yeah. I mean, you've come you've come a long way as well, Chucky. I mean, what an amazing! I must admit, what an amazing story. I'm I'm, I'm blown away again. It's like what a wicked interview. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, yeah. a, it's a it's a it's a real. There's a lot to tell. You know, we could sit here for hours and hours chewing the fat, man. That's just a small, small part of the story. I'll have to get you and um, maybe you and Doze in the back. At some yeah, stage. yeah. Grab big, Doze. Big grab shout out to Doze. Yeah, big shout out to the Dozy D. Dozy D. Uh, and his boys. PIC. PIC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Well, and the Prime. Get well soon, my friend. Definitely yeah. get well soon. And um, yeah, big. Um, anyone got any questions or whatever? Then just put them in the uh, comment section. But listen, uh, Chucky, an absolute honour chatting to you in the cab we could go on for another hour or two quite easily we could go on all night mate we could uh, crack open a bottle of uh, something and, and talk all night 
have to definitely hook up again but anyone watching this please share this around the social subscribe to this channel i've interviewed like public enemy scheme tmt uh t kid part one man parish aswad skinny man rodney p there's been so many interviews so please check them out and what can i say chocks that absolute incredible interview Thank and you very much, yeah. Thank you very much for having me in this wonderful, beautiful cab you have here. And this, this is the I'm brand... Just sort of get, I'm just sort of getting comfortable, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Just sort of this is the brand. This is the brand, This is the brand new Bimmer. Yeah, yeah, this is the... Yeah, this is this is a beast of a taxi, I must say. It's uh, it's luxurious. It? We could have a little rave in here. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do it. Yeah, turn the music up. <laughs> Uh, listen, what can I say? Brilliant. Chucky, absolute legend. Cool, thank you for Cheers, having me. Cheers, my man. Brilliant. Brilliant. Peace.